Good morning and welcome to New Community. We're glad that you could be with us. We are thankful that uh, you can worship with us. Hey, good morning and welcome to New Community. We're glad that you can worship with us this morning, whether you're worshiping with us at home or whether you're worshiping with us here. Uh, this has been a great summer. It's been a wonderful weather. So just uh, hope that you've been enjoying the weather and really enjoying the time and with uh, the nature and what God has uh, provided us with. So over the next hour, we're going to worship together through prayer, through song, through reading of God's word. Uh, Pastor Enoch is going to be uh, giving us the message, and we're also going to be having a uh, testimony today from one of our global partners. So uh, as we enter worship, let's quiet our hearts, and let's come to God with a word of prayer. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all the blessings that you've given us through your goodness and through your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you that uh, we can come to you directly in prayer that you hear us, and that we thank you for this opportunity that we have to honor you. And uh, we, we just, uh, again, thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. We know that uh, summer is a busy time for many of us. For some of us, it's vacations, and for some of us, it's just uh, spending time relaxing. But for many of us, it's also an opportunity to use that free time to serve you. So we want to lift up especially our uh, DC missions team who are right now going down to DC and they'll be ministering there with little lights for the next week. We pray for Pastor Ken and the team that you will just give them your spirit to guide them and to really help to serve with the little lights ministry down there to help the uh, under uh, represented and the underserved in the urban communities in DC. We pray for unity for the team. We pray for opportunities to share the gospel. And we just pray for your work to be done through them during this week. We also thank you that in the past month, past five weeks, Project Destiny in Boston has been able to do the same and be able to just uh, serve the people in the community and spread your good news and uh, your love through the brothers and sisters who have been serving in that capacity. And we just thank you for the opportunity. We pray that what they have done, the seeds that they have sown, will really bear fruit as we go forward. And we also pray for the uh, VBS that is coming up in August in uh, Chinatown, that again, this will be an opportunity where your people can just share the good news and show the love of Jesus to those in the community. Uh, we, we also pray for our global partners around the world, uh, those who are serving not just during the summer but throughout the year and throughout their lives uh, to bring the good news and to really bring your love and your peace to those who need to hear it. So we just lift up all those who are serving you in that capacity. We thank you for the opportunity that we have today to worship you and to honor you through our worship, and we pray that you will open our hearts and our minds and help us to listen to your word, bring it into our hearts, and also live our lives so that we can glorify you in all that we do. We thank you. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning again. Uh, I'd like to turn it over now to the worship team. For those of you who are looking at the online bulletin, just want to make a clarification that the first song that uh, they'll be leading off with is actually Jesus Loves Me. We'll be doing Cornerstone as the closing song. So we can turn it over now to the worship team. Good morning, everybody. As we rise, can we all stand, please? And as we are singing this Jesus, he loves me, I, got, I just want to encourage you guys to think about how much Jesus' love has penetrated into our lives, into every single part of our whole being, and how much so that there's, there's so many people in our community that are willing to give up their comfort, give up, give up their time, and give up their, their resources so that they can go go out and spread Jesus' love. So let's prepare our hearts and sing this first song. Oh, uh -huh. 
indeed Jesus does love us and it is his love and his sacrifice on the cross that gives us peace with Christ uh, with God and with one another so every week we take the opportunity to, sh to really share that peace and to honor God by sharing that peace with one another through the passing of the peace and we do that by turning to each other and saying may the peace of God be with you and by responding and also with you so let's take this opportunity whether it be here or online to share the peace of God uh, peace of Christ with one another
Good morning again. And uh, we have the opportunity today, and we have the privilege to actually uh, hear from uh, one of our global partners. Uh, Bill and Eva Lee have been longtime members of BCEC, and they also have been uh, working in the Hong Kong area. So we'd like to invite Eva to come up and just share with us in terms of how God has been working in uh, really around the world. Eva. Since English is not my mother tongue, so I need my cheat sheet with me. <laughs> it's so good to be here. Um, I was telling the Cantonese service that BCEC is my home. I came to BCEC in 1991. Uh, it was the best 10 years of my life. Uh, I met another Eva here and Lottie in the MIT Bible study group and wow, and I was able to attend the wedding both uh, in Hong Kong and also get um, to see them in BCEC. So every time we can meet, uh, this is a blessing. Every time we can meet, this is God's grace uh, upon us. For the past two years, um, I have experienced this is the best of time and worst of time. The season of light and season of darkness, a spring of hope, a winter of despair. I thought it was a description by Charles Dickens in A Tale of Two Cities, and just about Paris and London two centuries ago, and I just wonder, such a resurrection, whether it will happen to my life and the city where I was living. It came to all to one. I attend more funeral in that year of my whole life combined. The deceased include my relative, friends, parents, high school classmate, a pastor, colleague, former colleague, a colleague daughter, um, my husband, co-worker's wife, which is only 38 years old. And the list go on. The time I would receive a death notice every week. Then this year, my parents also have much health challenge. They both have COVID and my dad was sent to the hospital. My mom suffer, suffered from a sudden fracture of her spine. And because she had dementia, she didn't know she was admitted to the hospital. So she would crawl off, crawl off from the bed at night. So the nurse have no choice but tie her to the bed. I was so heartbroken. So I decided to stay with my mom and for the whole time, for seven days, and until she finished her surgery. And, and I, I felt that my whole body, my physical, um, mental, um, it was so drained. That last 18 months has been quite overwhelming. I still remember the time I was writing a memorial tribute on my friend's dad. This friend used to serve in BCEC for many years as a children pastor. I remember I couldn't stop crying. All the memories of how I met the parents and how his kindness and encouragement to me and all the image thread through my mind. It took me two weeks to finish a short travel. Then the loss and grief become so strong, and my body gave out different signal of fatigue and depression to the point that I couldn't concentrate on my daily tasks. Then, the resurrected God showed up. He didn't come in the form of Ezekiel 37, the dry bones come to life and new tenant flesh and to form a new body. God came in the form of Zechariah 4, not by might, not by power, but my spirit, say the Lord Almighty. Despite all my shortcomings, the Lord is working in a way that brings true revival. God has given many young people in my circle a deep desire to know God, and they have been able to see God's blessing everywhere. Some of them were even first Christian in the entire family. 
do we have um, a picture up there? Um, my fellowship um, has tripled in size compared to before COVID. A few even received baptism last year. College students would come to me and ask me to disciple them, wanting to study the Bible together. And the student who moved to US, and she told me normally it's only a handful of people wanting to come to church. But this year, they have 30 students wanting to come to church, a physical church to worship God together. One of them wrote to me for my birthday and Mother's Day. She said, you are a mother. God sent to me. God actually gave me three moms, one who born me, one who raised me, one who guide me in my life and scripture, who gave me so much love. I may have lost my biological mom, but God sent you to me to love me unconditionally and affirm my value and erase my insecurities. I surely will let her know it is God who sent me to her. Another um, guy student who was into drugs and girls and who just became so much on fire for Jesus and want to be a social worker and study in a seminary later on to reach more people for Christ. Even my dad, who refused to believe in Jesus for many decades, came to accept Jesus and receive baptism last December. I came to realize it's not about me. It's all about God. God can use a broken vessel like me to accomplish his plan and his dream. It's nothing about my dream and my way of accomplish anything. It's all about him and his dream for me, his dream of having all of me, letting him use me whatever ways he desire, even in my brokenness. May I and Bill be always rely on him. When the Lord stripped away everything that bring me security, he let me become aware of his presence each day and his bringing a revival that I cannot forum. May we all aware the time and the seasons of God. Um, I have three prayer requests. Uh, number one, uh, I will need one to two manpower to help me and Bill move about 50 boxes from Salisbury to Burlington, um, about 4, 4, 5.30 to 7 p.m. If anyone can help me, uh, feel free to let me know, and I will go to Mandarin service afterward, uh, or let one of the pastors contact me. Um, another thing is uh, on Tuesday, uh, me and Bill will go back to our city, uh, and we need to have a negative PCR test uh, so that we can go to the hotel quarantine room in my city and may God give us a safe trip. The last, um, may my student friends, um, just like what uh, Bill said here, let us be a maker of peace. Uh, let us be the light of the world. No matter where we go, uh, we can bring healing, we can bring reconciliation in the broken and um, challenging world. So thank you for your prayers and thank you for all the support in many, many decades. And we pray for you and let's remember one another. Thank you. Not, I am not Pastor Ken, just in case when I take my mask off, you all don't go, wow. Uh, but Bill and Eva, um, when Steve Liu and I got to visit uh, your part of the world, we got to stay there with, with you and appreciate the ministry there, seeing both your ministry. Um, so thank you for your faithfulness. And I actually missed them when they were in Chinatown because I was out of town doing a wedding. So I get to see them here. So, okay, let's pray for them. Would you rise as you're able? And let's just lift up uh, Eva and Bill. If you want to extend your hand as a form of sort of extending your prayer, but um, we're going to pray for them both. Heavenly Father, Lord, as challenging as the world has been in the last few years, I can only imagine what it's like to work with the kinds of students and young adults and young people that both Eva and Bill are serving in their part of the world in their city, which has so much going on. So we ask your mercy to be upon them. Give them strength 
be faithful for so many you've been faithful to them for so many years and we trust that you would give them the joy and the strength to continue to serve in your power and hope lord very practically pray for those i think like 20 boxes that have to go from shrewsbury to burlington we pray for the help we pray that you protect them we also pray for their return to their city and all the various policies in place of getting an active negative PCR test and quarantining. It's a lot of hassle and work to travel these days internationally. So just guide them and be with them and let them know you're with them. And we pray for the work of your spirit among the students and their friends and young people, that you would be doing a revival and doing something great there. Help uh, them to continue to be the spiritual parents, brothers and sister, the, the friends, the light of Christ to everyone they meet and give them safe journeys as they return back to their assignment um, as they do their ministry and do their calling. So we love them. We thank you for them bringing here that they have to visit, uh, they get to visit so many worship services and churches. It's probably been not the most restful time in the States, so we pray that you would give them the charge and energy as they get them here. We thank you and pray and commit them both in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's give them a hand. Please be seated. Oh, Pastor Stephen and Nancy, they know the rule. They wait until the minister says you can sit down. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So um, I'm Enoch. Welcome to our new community worship service. Um, it's been a few weeks since I've been here, and pa Pastor Ken, along with some of our lay leaders, and another minister, Steve Liu, is leading a team down to D.C. for our short-term missions trip for this week, so our hearts are with them as they make their way down today. Uh, it's my opportunity and privilege to preach this morning, so if you have a Bible, I invite you to take it out and meet me flip, tap, scroll to the book in the Old Testament, the book of First Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 29. You can find it by going to the table of contents, unless you have the Old Testament memorized. First Chronicles, chapter 29, verses 10 through 19. Greetings to those of you who are joining us uh, online right now, live stream, or perhaps watching later on this week, or later on. We're going to read First Chronicles, chapter 29, verses 10 through 19, and then I will say a prayer for us. First Chronicles, chapter 29, verses 10 through 19. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. Verse 14. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own have we given you. For we are strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow and there is no abiding. O Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things. And now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. Grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, performing all that he may build the palace for which I have made provision. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray for us. Gracious Father, as we continue in this time of worship by looking into your word, having heard about Eva and Bill sharing your word in other cities, having heard and prayed for Pastor Ken and our short-term missions team to D.C., ministering in word and deed, uh, the word, the gospel, the hope of the Jesus Christ. And as we consider returning now to our sermon series that we've been in for the summer on due honor, the honor that is due, we pray that you would alert us and challenge us and help us to see. Be with us now, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Wealth and honor. Riches and honor. That's what this passage is about as we've made our way through the summer on our sermon series called Do Honor. 
So we spent, just a quick recap, we spent several weeks talking about how God has invited us and commanded us to give honor to certain people, those in spiritual authority, those in political power, those who are widows, those who are in need, honoring our parents. And we spent several weeks thinking about institutions that God specifically invites people to honor, namely marriage and the Sabbath. And then we spent a couple weeks talking about the danger of honor, the perils, the honor. So now as we turn the last four weeks of the summer and we move our way into uh, the traditional end of summer, which is Labor Day weekend before we start the traditional beginning of fall, uh, we are thinking about what it means to honor God. And today we're talking about money and honor. Now, that doesn't sound very spiritual. Again, as I look around the room, uh, perhaps a lot of us identify as Christians and perhaps a lot of us can relate to being uh, either you know, children of immigrants or descendants of immigrants or having an Asian background. And whether you're Asian or Chinese or whether you're just Christian, pursuing honor and wealth doesn't feel very spiritual. Can you imagine if we were in a small group and we're like sharing prayer requests or going around the circle and saying, how can we pray for you? And over here you get someone that says, well, I have a job interview. Please pray for my job interview. Okay, that, that sounds good. What about you? Well, one of my relatives has sick, so would you pray for her healing? Okay, that, that sounds good too. What about you? Oh, I have a big test coming up. Pray that you would help, you know, that I could study and do well. That sounds good. What about you? Pastor Enoch, can you pray that God would bestow upon me just obscene riches and honor? Should I say, well, that's of course, young man, that's great. Like, it feels weird to ask for riches and honor. And yet, actually, that's what this passage is about. Now, David, the, the main person praying in this passage, never in this text asks for riches and honor, but truly, he's had it, and he's sought after it for much of his life. Now, you might think, well, as Christians or people or just humble people, we don't ask for riches and honor. Well, when you pray for a job promotion, what are you saying? That maybe I would do well so that I could get a promotion, honor that I could get a raise, wealth. When you're asking for prayer for a test, which is totally Asian Christian, right? You know, praying for my test, what are you asking for? I pray that I do well, get a good grade, totally honor. Why? So I can go to a good college, total Asian honor. Why? So that I can get that good job and pray for the interview, honor and wealth. Perhaps if you're cynical or jaded or even someone who used to go to church, you know, Christians don't talk about honor and wealth. They totally want it. They totally do, and it's all around us. And to actually think about that is almost like just kidding ourselves. So actually, this is a passage where we talk about honor and wealth, and it is explicit, and it's all over the passage. So this morning into afternoon, as we look at this passage, both here in Newton campus and the early morning and late afternoon service for Chinatown, we're considering what it means to honor God with wealth and honor. So there are three points I'd like us to see. Number one, what is the role of wealth and honor? Like, what is the role of wealth and honor? What is it supposed to do for our relationship with God, particularly with our relationship with each other? What is the role that wealth and honor are supposed to play? Number two, we're going to consider what is God's intended use? What is the proper use of wealth and honor? How should we dispense of it? How should we deal with it? What's the proper way to consider and use the wealth and honor that we may or may not think we have? What is the proper role? Uh, what's the role of wealth and honor in our lives, especially spiritually? What is the proper use of wealth and honor? And then number three, what is the goal? What is the supposed expected result when we understand wealth and honor in that way? Now, again, you know, maybe Pastor Ken next week when he comes back from his missions trip and his trip is going to get a bunch of prayer requests. Pray for our small group to be the most wealthy and honored small group. No, pray for our Sunday school class to have the most wealth. I mean, let's take a look at that because maybe actually we will learn something here and how wealth and honor are used to honor God. So number one, what is the proper role of wealth and honor? So to understand this passage as we come into First Chronicles chapter 29, I don't have time to read it here, but in verses 1 to 9, let me give you the background. What just happened right before David began this prayer in verse 10? Well, what just happened? If you have a Bible, I give you permission to multitask and start looking at verse 1 because some of you are already doing that. But basically, David, it's 1 Chronicles 29 is the end of a chronicle of his life and kingdom and ministry or his, his reign, and he's near the end of his life. He's about to probably die, and he's about to have his son Solomon ascend to the throne, and he's doing something significant that will sort of be his legacy. And he basically says, you know, for my kingdom, my life, my whole purpose has been for people to experience the presence of God. 
If you know your Old Testament, that's the whole purpose of the Ark of the Covenant. It's God's presence. That's what David was talking about when he's singing his psalms and songs. And so he cares about them to have God's presence. And so David really wants his people, the people of Israel, to have a place called the temple. Now, the temple was not just like a place that people went to their church. It was a place where, yes, they would go worship, but it was also a place where sacrifices were made, where you can connect with God and be reconciled with God and each other. It was also the place where the poor were ministered to. So the temple represented not just a location where you went to church, but also the worship of God, reconciliation with God, mercy and justice ministries in that society. It was just the presence of God. And so he basically really wants this to happen. And so he begins like sort of his death speech by saying this, I am going to donate all my treasury to the temple, to the construction of the temple. And if you read it, it talks about thousands of uh, denomination of money called talents and talents of gold, talents of silver, talents of iron, all those things. And the talent is basically, some scholars consider it, 10 years worth of a work of a person. So it's a lot of money when you can donate thousands of talents, tons of money. That's what he does right before. And then when he does it, I'm, he tells the people, I'm going to donate all this money, my treasury, to the building of God's temple so that we can experience his presence. What are you going to do? And the people respond. And they're like, man, if our leader is going to donate, then we're all going to. So then the, the rest of the verses, about five and six onward, talk about how they all donated all this money. So here's the background. Here's the context. David, the king, has donated all his treasury, pretty much, and the people of Israel have also cheerfully and joyously donated all this money, offered, they pledged, okay, to this construction, and as a response to all of that giving, David praises God, which is kind of weird. So it's like, wow, because we can give so much money, we're going to praise God. Let's take a look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, therefore, because they all donated all this money, therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all assembly. And David said, blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our father, forever and ever. And then he kind of goes off. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness. And he starts piling on. And the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all both riches and honor, wealth and honor come from you and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all and now we thank you our God and praise your glorious name. It's kind of a strange thing to praise God for. Why are you praising God today? Oh, because he's been, you know, I, I got a parking spot. Why are you praising God today? Oh, because, you know, the weather's good. Why are you praising God today? Because I just donated a chunk load of money. That's kind of strange. What is the role of wealth and honor? What is happening here? Well, the role of wealth and honor in the life of a person is to make them ask, where did I come from, who am I, and how did I get here? And by the very means that they were able to donate so much is a testament to what God has done for them in his generosity. Now, that sounds very abstract, so let me attempt to make it a little more concrete. I've been at the privilege of being in this church for <laughs> over two decades, which sounds not young. It doesn't feel young either, but over two decades. And one of the neat things about being in a place like this is I can track sort of with the teenagers that I first had when I got here. Those teenagers, my oldest class of teenagers, they are now 38. They are not young anymore. Neither do they look it. But the point is... Um, <laughs> They, they are older now, and there's a, among the many things that one can learn if you kind of stay in the same place and if God allows you to stay and no one's fired me yet and that kind of thing, is there's one trend that was pretty, un I didn't expect it. Here's what I saw as teenagers went to college, a lot of them began to get jobs and began to do well for themselves. This is what, this would be a common thing for maybe a child, maybe some siblings, or maybe a young married couple. They said this, Pastor Yonok, we're going on vacation soon, and we are so looking forward to it. And I would say, that's great, you know. Are you looking forward to the time off? Are you looking forward to the fun things you're going to do? And those are there, but here's the thing that struck me. No, Pastor Yonok, we're so looking forward because we are bringing on our vacation, we are bringing our parents. <laughs> and I'm like, tell me why you're so looking forward to it. And this is the kind of story we get, especially from our Chinatown urban campus. Well, Pastor Yonok, our parents never had vacation growing up. 
I mean, they worked hard. They actually might have been professionally trained in their country of origin, but because of perhaps language ability, they came here, and though they practiced medicine or law in their own countries, they came here, and because of the limited English, they are working manual labor jobs, entry-level, low-wage jobs, these kind of basic jobs that a high schooler might do for the summer in between sophomore you know, and junior year in high school. They're doing these jobs. They work so hard, and so I am... The fact that we can, whether it's kind of a, just more of a down-to-earth vacation where you just drive up the coast of East, you know, the country and go somewhere in New Hampshire for a pretty modest couple days by the, you know, in a beach or by a lake, or whether you're flying across the ocean to you know, uh, Europe or Asia, a lot of these young adults are really excited because their ability to be able to offer their parents something like a vacation is a testament to what their parents did for them. It's a testament to the work they, they did. It's a testament to the sacrifice. It's a testament to whether it's their parents or grandparents to the dedication and sacrifice. They can pay for a vacation, not because they're so great and work so hard and are so much better than their parents, but they can pay for a vacation, however modest or exorbitant it is, because of what has been done for and when David sees that he can donate all this money to the cause of the temple, when he sees the people of God and the people of Israel able to donate money, he is filled with gratitude because he says, the only way we could have mustered and donated all this incredible wealth is because God has been so generous and kind to us. What is the role of riches and honor in your life and in my life? It's supposed to make us pause and go, how did we get here? To whom do we owe gratitude to? To whom should we be thankful? Because riches and wealth will force you down one of two paths, pretty much. I mean, it's possible to not go down a path, but really rare in my limited observation. Either you will go the way and riches and wealth, well, because I earned it. Well, because I worked hard. Well, because I was scrappy, because I was smart, because I figured out the best way to do it. I beat out everyone else. I am awesome. If you, acclaim, if you achieve riches and wealth in honor, it is natural for one of the ways to become to feel basically like you worked hard. And maybe you did work hard, but really it's also a sense of superiority. Or if you have riches and wealth, you will go through life and every time you get another promotion, every time you get a raise, every time you have good fortune, you go, who am I? Wow. Like, where did I come from? N David says, we were sojourners, we were immigrants. We had nothing. God in his power and might was gracious to us. And I understand that people perhaps in this room or listening online or watching online might think, I, I don't understand. I, I'm not on the positive end of that you know, financial equation. This is another sermon, but really the biblical definition of poverty might shock you. There's, there's clear passages in the Bible, and it has to do with like if a, someone who's poor you know, wants to have some food and they're going to work that day, and they, as a deposit for the food, they give you their cloak, there's commands in the Bible in the Old Testament that says if that's their only cloak, even if they haven't paid you back for their food, you have to return the cloak to them because that's their only garment. They're going to sleep on that. So biblically, if no matter how humble your means may be, if you have two or more changes of clothes, you're technically not poor. No, I, I understand that doesn't make you feel good when I say that, and there's a lot of biblical uh, work to explain that. But the basic notion is here in this country, arguably one of the most prosperous nations in human history. And I know a lot of us in this room might feel we're on the losing end of that comparison. But realistically, it is very difficult statistically in Newton to starve to death. Or to, I mean, if, you, if someone sees you on the street, someone's probably going to call emergency services, and whether you have insurance or not, they're going to give you fluids, they're going to try to take care of you to at least get you back to basic health. Again, I, I know people's lives and hardships, there's a lot of challenges, even in this room, I'm sure. But the notion here is this. When you have wealth or honor, it's causing you, the role is to go, where did I come from? How did I get here? And when David sees the ability to give and to construct this magnificent temple, he is filled with, wow, God has been so gracious. Wealth and honor come from his hand. It is in his hand. He gives might and strength to those. And so David looks at the wealth and honor he has amassed and is humbled by it. He's grateful to God. That's the role of wealth and honor. It's supposed to make us ask, where do we come from? How do we get here? And to whom should we be grateful to? So if that's the role that wealth and honor play, when we're talking about it, what do we do with it? 
how do we use wealth and honor? And to come from here, you could look earlier in the, in the chapter, verses 1 through 9, have a lot of it. But what I really want to talk about beginning here is, let's pick it up in verse 14 to kind of see the proper role of wealth and honor, God's invitation and design for how we should do it. Take a look at verse 14. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able to offer thus willingly, thus meaning the incredible amount? For all things come from you and of your own have we given you. For we are strangers before you and sojourners, as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no abiding. O Lord our God, all the abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. I know, my God, that you test the heart, and that pleasure and uprightness and the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things, and now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. David is talking about who are we that we would offer so much. And so if you actually consider and study another time the kind of the nature of the sacrifice and the offering that David and the people of Israel gave, I would say wealth and honor, there's sort of two guiding principles. Obviously, there's a clear uh, invitation to give joyfully and joyous, you know, joyfully with great joy, but there's two markers that I believe mark the sacrifice and the gift of David and the people of Israel for the temple. And they are like this. One is, to the wealth and honor is meant to be given with generosity, and wealth and honor are meant to be given with sacrificiality or sacrificially. So wealth and honor to be generous and sacrificial. So what does generous mean? Generous in this context really means an impressive amount, a, an amount that is almost beyond the typical person's means. Now, Hang on, because I know some of you are saying, well, that means if I'm low income, I can't be generous. Uh, well, you can't be generous in the impressive large amount way. You can be another way, which we're going to talk about. But in this context, when we talk about the impressiveness, the, the impact of such a large amount, we're talking about generosity. The second piece is we're talking about sacrifice, the idea that you have to give. So if generosity means giving a lot, and often it's combined giving a lot, then sacrifice is, is giving till it hurts. Or to be very, very concrete, sacrifice means giving until it lowers your standard of living. Because you can be very generous, very generous, right? If you have a lot of money, but it doesn't affect your lifestyle. You still eat the same way, travel the same way, shop and buy stuff the same way. So you can be generous, but you can't, you're not necessarily sacrificial. Likewise, you can be very sacrificial and give of your last, you know, the last might of the widow. And so I understand you want to say, well, that's very generous, and it's sacrificial. Because you can be generous without sacrificial. You can also be sacrificial without being generous. So the invitation here, the kind of giving that comes from the people of God combining their resources is generous, sacrificial giving. When my brothers and I, I have an older brother and younger brother, when we were around high school, my parents had, I believe, their 30th wedding anniversary, somewhere around there. Could be Ken. Maybe it's 20. I can't remember. But basically, it was an anniversary with a zero in the number, which is very important in Chinese, right? So, so we're going to do something special. So in those days, pre-internet, pre-cell phone, pre-everything, uh, the only way you go shopping is, like, the phone book, right? So, or you literally, as teenagers, we would basically go to the shopping mall, and we would just walk down the mall, because that's all you could do. There's no website. There's... there's there's, there's nothing. So we walked through the mall, and I don't know which one of us thought of it, but we thought, this is their 20 or 30th anniversary, so what are we going to do to make it special? We decided to buy them a gold-plated plate. I know, so practical, right? A gold-plated plate that I thought was gold, but I'm thinking now it's probably gold-plated. I'm not even sure it was gold-plated. It's probably gold-colored plating. But the point is, it was a plate, had their names on it, and had their wedding anniversary, you know, that year, and the year they were married, all these things, and it said are from their sons, you know, Elijah, Enoch, and Jacob. It was that whole thing. And I remember thinking, wow, this is so generous because it really it took all three of us to cobble together what little money we had. And it was sacrificial because it hurt. No video games for like weeks and months. I mean, this is like sacrifice, right? So I'm kind of joking, but, but it took a lot. And my parents got it. They were like, 
I was really hoping my mom would really like it. And to this day, it's sitting there in my parents' house, and I look at it, and it's how I remember the day they're married. Every Christmas, I look at it, so when I come back to Boston, I know the date that they're married. So it's, it's very practical. But the idea is it's both generous. It took a lot of contribution from perhaps multiple people and sacrificial. What is the proper role? What is God's intended design? If you have wealth and honor, and the more you have, God is inviting us to give generously and with sacrificially to his kingdom purposes. That's the invitation, that you're giving sacrificially and generous, generously to his purposes. Now, sometimes, like in this case, you're giving to a corporate, effe- a, a corporate goal, like building the temple. And in the life of a church, we've given corporately to perhaps acquire this building, to perhaps renovate the building, perhaps acquire property in Chinatown so we can have worship. So we know what that's like to do that together, sacrificially and generously. But the invitation is really doing it together. Now, sometimes people say, well, you know, my giving is between me and God. Let's think about that statement. My giving is between me and God. I don't think that's biblical. Yes, you have to stand before God, to account for how you manage your life and everything, your resources. But it's not, doesn't, it affects more than just you. It's not just, just me and God. Actually, what you do affects everyone else, especially if you're in the church. When I was in high school, we would have friends that go out to lunch regularly. And so, you know, we'd split the bill, and this is none, we didn't have credit cards back in the day. We all just did cash, and we actually had to use paper to calculate the, when divided the things. So depending on whose turn it was to split the bill, they would just estimate. Oh, your dinner, your, your lunch was like $7.95. <laughs> this is a long time ago. $7.95, so just give, I don't know, $9, and we'll factor in tax and tip, all the stuff like that. Well, when it was my turn to divvy up the bill, I would actually take out the paper and take out the pencil and pen and actually do the math on the back of the napkin. And so I remember one time, you know, we had a bunch of people eating, and we are short like 12 12 to $14, depending on how you do tip. And they're like, and you know what they said? Oh, don't worry, Enoch. Well, just, there was like three of us left divvying up the bill. People had left the restaurant. They're outside waiting. We'll just each give a few bucks. And it, I was being picky. No, 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 no. I'm pretty sure my math is right. We are down like 12 to 14 bucks, depending on tip. We are down this. Well, it's fine. It's no big deal. No, I know we can do it. It's not about we can each chip in. Someone didn't give their money. That's the only way you could do it. So I actually, did you pay? Yeah. Did you pay? Yeah. Did you pay? Yeah. Did you pay? Enoch, I said, yeah. We've been to lunch many times for many years. Yeah. I've never paid. So what? He's like, yeah, so what I do is I just, it's all cash, so the bill comes around, and we all chip in, and he's like, I watch. As you guys goes, oh, we're short like nine bucks, ten bucks, and I watch as, oh, we're just chipping one more dollar, and then I just go home. And I said, that's really smart, but mean, and it's, what you do with your money affects everyone if we're called by God to work together towards some goal. Now, it doesn't mean I'm going to tell you how much you should give. But the invitation is to give of your wealth and honor generously and sacrificially. And wealth is about donating money, sure. Honor, I believe it's about honoring giving your time. We were just at a wedding last night. We were at a wedding a few weeks ago, and when the parents of the bride and groom come up, you know what the very older Chinese way of saying or older Japanese way, they'll say this and say, oh, we are honored by your presence. So you can be sacrificial and generous with your, t- with your money and your wealth, or you can be sacrificial and generous with your honor, which is your presence, your time. So here's the invitation. When was the last time you individually or as a family or we as a church were sensing a call by God to use the wealth and honor we have in a generous and sacrificial way? Does it happen once a year, once every 10 years, once a day? And God, I have a feeling, is actually giving us opportunities all the time. Now, I don't know what you should spend your money on. If you want to come to my office and put everything on the table, here's our expenses, here's the opportunities. I can maybe, we can talk about some Bible passages that will apply. But ultimately, yes, I I don't think I can say what you should do exactly because I I don't know what God on the sea tells me. But I think we are invited to understand that wealth and honor is supposed to not make us more self-sufficient, but actually make us more humble. Not make us more, honestly, feeling like we've earned it and we deserve it, but make us more grateful and more servant-like. 
And the role of that is so that when we have wealth and honor, we use it generously and sacrificially for the purposes of God. Sacrificially, when was the last time that because you gave something, you had to give up something, either a type of way to eat or a vacation or some standard of living that had to consciously go down? Or with your time. Make a commitment to invest in someone, care for someone, meet with someone. So because you've invested that time, you have to have a lifestyle change. You can't do certain things with your time. That's the invitation. Because honor and wealth are used by a God. To, the role is to make us go, wow, where do we come from? Where do we get all this? We have so much, perhaps. We can be grateful because God is the one that is so generous. It's all by him. And therefore, if it's all from him when we have it, we can give it generously and sacrificially to his kingdom purposes. And so what's the result? What's the point about this? What's the goal? So now we come here to the final verses. I invite you to look at it, verse 17 to the end. Verse 17 says this. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things, and now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. O oh Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. Grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, performing all so that he may build the palace for which I have made provision. Now, obviously, in this context, the palace is the temple. It's a really ornate structure. I mean, kind of weird. Are you going to church? Well, we call it the palace. Whoa, like, it's kind of impressive. But this was a marvelous, it would be a marvelous structure. And Solomon would eventually go and construct this, and it would truly be a wonder of the ancient world. But the issue is not just like, well, you're supposed to, the end result is a nice building that people can look at and go, wow, God's great. Notice the invitation. He says, our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, thinking about his faithfulness, and we've been doing this. Now for Solomon, would you direct his heart towards you? Would you make it so he keeps all your commandments, your testimonies, your statutes? Meaning that when you honor God, it's not just a one-time donation or gift. And here's the purpose. Here's the role. Here's the, here's the result that's supposed to be. It's not that we just honor God with our gifts, but we honor God with our heart. You offer up your gifts to God. You offer up you offer up your hearts to God. And this, sadly, is what happened with Solomon. He offered up his gifts to God. I mean, the temple was truly impressive by all accounts in the ancient world, but he did not offer his heart. God doesn't need our money, frankly, or our time, but he invites us to participate because he's a gracious God that anything you have to give, any time you have, any talent, any, anything, wisdom, encouragement, presence, it's because God gave it to you and me. And it's not just so that we can therefore give up our gifts to God, but we can offer our hearts in joyful obedience in every way. That we actually learn to love God and live with our whole lives. And that is the invitation. So if you're sitting here thinking, oh, Pastor, you know, I did the once every year or two zinger about money and time. I need to volunteer more for church. We need to start doing junior worship more. I got to go to TIOB. Well, yeah, Pastor Ken would probably say, yeah, that's good. But really, if you leave the sermon thinking, I need to do more or give more, I have failed you. The point of this passage is not that you and I need to do more. It's that God has already done so much. And that's the heart of Christ. Because when we talk about giving generously for the temple or giving sacrificially for the temple, that's the character of God. What did Jesus do? Jesus gave his life generously, his time, his whole coming to the world, and he gave his life sacrificially. The point isn't to go, well, we got to go back and look at our finances, tighten our belt, and just write a big check to some charity or some missions organization or some nonprofit or some church or some person in need. By all means, consider that but it really is about recognizing Christ, what he's done as our cornerstone, as our savior, as our God. He's done all this for us. And therefore, he invites us and he blesses us with wealth and honor so that we can remember to ask, where do we come from? How do we get here? How have we become so blessed? And if you are living in a comfortable place, if you have good education, if you're able to provide for your spiritual children or your biological children, that is an opportunity to praise God and to then consider the wealth and honor you and I have
to use generously and sacrificially for others, for his kingdom purposes, because it's not just about giving up our hearts. Uh, it's, it's not just about giving our gifts to God. It's about giving all of ourselves, our hearts, in joyful obedience to him. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, as we consider the words here, you invite us to give of our wealth and honor to you, but even that is something you've given to us first. So make our hearts soft and tender, even melt them if they're hardened. Some of us, we really feel like we don't owe anything to anyone. We've worked so hard, got no breaks. And Lord, I, I can understand that. Some people have worked really hard and still struggle. But no matter what, no matter where we are, any blessing we have, the Bible is clear. If we're honest, it really does come from you. Help us that with every blessing we get, we become more humble, more grateful, more worshipful because of who you are. And in turn, let us use those gifts to really bless others for your purposes. So give us an eye for how we can give up our wealth or time generously and sacrificially because it's not just about those things. It's about offering all our hearts to you because you've given us everything, your son, your spirit. We worship you and love you and we thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. So thank you, Pastor Ina, for your message. And uh, this is a good opportunity to apply what we just heard. So as we, again, ponder Pastor Ina's message and we look upon the time of offering, first of all, let's acknowledge, let's praise, let's thanks, thank God for the blessings he has given to us. Let us give generously of our riches, but let us give of our hearts also. So as you just go through this week, we have the offering now, but as you go through this week, just ponder upon that, how you can give your heart to Christ. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to the worship team to close this in, well, closing song. Just like Pastor Enoch said about how Jesus is our cornerstone, he is the ultimate example of giving generously and sacrificially. So let's all rise as we worship him. Jesus blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest strength. The holy trust in Jesus. My hope is built.
Let us remember that whatever blessings we may experience comes from a gracious and loving God. And if you don't know him, we invite you to consider the work and the life of Jesus Christ and be full of his spirit. Now go from here. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us now and forevermore. And God's people together said, amen. Go in peace.